wanted to start with this because it's been bugging me. Trump is today in Asia. He's going to be meeting the Chinese Premier. The only thing on his mind is soya. And I think we need to understand the crisis of modern agriculture from the lens of soya. Here is a crop which is grown in vast tracts of the US. It is a single crop. It uses every modern method to grow. In fact, if you see those, all your large machinery is there. Everything that you know in the name of intensive modern farming is being practiced to grow soya. And today it has a huge crisis, both of farmers who are crying that they cannot meet their cost in spite of the subsidies that they get and markets have collapsed. And of course, he's negotiating with us on dairy. That's our big sticking point is dairy. And if we allow the dairy imports into India, we also make sure that our smallholder farmers, our entire business model gets destroyed. Why? Because they overproduce food that they cannot consume themselves. And that's the basis of the modern farming system. But then if you look at EU, it's even worse. The European Union, I mean, all of us have grown up with the numbers of the kind of subsidy that is paid to an individual EU farmer. And if you look at it, and I was looking at some of the data, they've covered it up. So they have a green subsidy box, a blue subsidy. But you add it up, it's equivalent to almost 90% of the cost of the farmer. 90% of the cost of the farmer. Okay? We pay subsidy to our farmers by paying it to the urea company. And we then add it up as how we are subsidizing the Indian farmer. Okay? Here the farmer gets subsidy. And yet the minute the government is saying, let's have a new green deal. Let's add to the organic, the acreage under organic farming. Let's reduce the amount of pesticides that are used. Let's do everything that is good. Let's do better manure management. Let's do better livestock management so that methane is reduced. The farmers are up in arms and saying, over our dead body. And the EU has had to roll back its new green deal for farmers. Why? Here is a cost that the farmers can't bear. Now think about it from our point of view. When our farmers are already non-subsidized, and how then does this model of farming, where you're adding costs to be green, can be borne by the farmers? Going green is critical, but in this method of farming, it only adds to the cost to the farmer to go green. And in a market which is so subsidized, even they can't afford it. We were looking at commodity markets in Africa. We've also done, just produced a state of Africa's environment report. So when we were producing that and looking at the commodity market trade in Africa, one of the connections that hit me was the fact that Africa, the continent of Africa, with the world's largest arable land, has gone from being a net producer to a net importer of food. Just imagine. And one of the reasons why it's happening in Africa, and that's what our report brought out, is that it's happening because Africans cannot compete with the cheap subsidized food that is now flooding their markets. What is Africa importing? It's importing from the European Union and it's importing all the food which their farmers grow at such massive subsidy. And then when we were looking at the commodity trade, I also found another disabling factor, which is that if the Ghanaian uh, farmer grows cocoa, and they export raw cocoa, there is no tariff on it. But the minute they export chocolate, there is a 40% tariff on it. So Trump's tariffs are not new in our world. Okay? They are designed to make sure there is no value addition in the part of the world that needs it. On our side, we are finding there is a pincer movement. On one hand, our farmers are finding that they have the crisis of climate change, where extreme weather events are putting a huge stress on their ability to cope. 
It's adding to their risk, it's adding to their cost. Then there is the fact that every input is costing more and more to grow food and the cost of fuel, electricity, water, every input is going up. And more than that, we are a poor country and so governments have to procure food at cheaper and cheaper rates. And the minute food inflation happens, everybody starts crying. So import of food happens and that depresses the cost of the farmer again. That's really the core of the challenge that we have here. So the first thing that I find very difficult and I find very few agricultural scientists, I think there are some exceptions in this room, but very few agricultural scientists who, are, who understand when I say, let's rework the science of productivity. What do you mean by productivity? We are saying you need to make sure in an age of climate change, the problem is the higher the input, the higher the risks. And the indebtedness crisis is what is impacting livelihoods, it's impacting health. But more than that, it's impacting the ability of farmers to invest or reinvest in land and water. So the poorer they are, the more they discount the land and water that they need for their own survival. So you need food that is low input so that risks are lower and you need returns that are higher. And you need to make sure that the cost of food is affordable. Because if the cost of food goes up, like in Europe, nobody can afford it. Or in US, nobody can afford that food unless government subsidize it. We don't have the money to put in that subsidy. So we need cost of food which the poorest in this country can afford. And that is really where the challenge is. The challenge is to grow food at affordable rates, which means Investing not in just inputs, but investing in the land, investing in water. But we also know that the watermark of climate change is really not about a single event. And this is what we are seeing in our world is really change the, the, the coping ability of the poorest. So I'm always asked this, but pehle bhi baad aati thi, pehle bhi sukha padta tha, pehle bhi sardi hoti thi, thandi hoti thi. To aaj aap kyun keh rahi hai ki ye jalwayu parivartan ke karan hai? The reason is very clear that it is about the increasing intensity and frequency of these events. It is about the change nature of these events that we are seeing today. And we know, as all of us are witness to this now in our world, each year a new record is being broken. It's getting more hot, it's getting more cold, it's getting more rain. And this is something that we need to understand is breaking the backs of the poorest. They're losing their ability to cope with these repeated and frequent events. It is about exacerbating poverty. So then, if there is really and we are seeing this revenge of nature, then we need to discuss adaptation as well. Now, the, all the buzz about adaptation, to me, the two most strongest issues on adaptation are getting information to farmers about the unseasonality of the weather, getting information to farmers in terms of what needs to be done, and getting insurance that actually works so that they can cope and rebuild their lives. So this then becomes my second part of the ring, which is climate, which is resilient breeds, carbon markets, advisories, forecasting, insurance, and most importantly, once again here, the question of soil health. Agriculture is about the food that is grown for, for humans and of course livestock, but humans. And the question that we have to start asking is, what does this food and climate connection mean? Because I'm always told in the Western world that when they say that they are climate advocates, they say they're vegans. Oh, it's like it goes together. I'm a vegan and I'm a climate activist. And I keep asking them, so how does veganism make you a climate activist? I haven't understood that. And they look at me and say, but you know, it's, it, it, either I'm organic or I'm vegan and I'm a climate activist. It's like, you know, so I, I think it's important for us to bring our knowledge to the ground on this to say, it's not really about being a vegan. It's not about being a vegetarian even. 
it is about the way food is grown and how meat is grown. It is not about being a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian. That's a personal choice. That's somebody's personal choice. But don't connect it to climate. Climate change is not about being a vegetarian. Because then you will end up eating soya. And overgrowing the soya that you eat in veggie burgers. That is not going to solve the world's problem. The problem is going to be about how the meat is grown. Is it grown after clearing large amounts of land? Is it grown in intensive farming systems? Is it grown in a way that you add to the toxins in the air and the water? Or is it grown in smallholder livestock farming systems? Nutrition again is not about being a vegan or being a, a vegetarian. Is what we eat for nutrition and how much we eat. So if we eat meat as part of our diet, then it's good protein. But if we eat only meat and too much meat, it makes you fat and it makes you prone to health risks like heart disease. So it's really about food being medicine, food being for nutrition and food sense coming into each one of us. And that's where the climate connection needs to be understood better. And we should not let it get into this new dogma of I'm a vegan, so I'm a climate activist. That will not work in our world. So what we eat determines our health. It is about nutrition, medicines, and then of course, of course, the toxins. So this then finally is what our team puts together as our main agenda for sustainable food. Connecting the dots between the farmer, the nutrition of people, and, the, and climate change. The livelihood of farmers to nature to nutrition. That's really that wheel that I think we are all here to discuss more and more and that we need to now delve more deeply to understand what is working, what is not, so that we can bring this practice to some amount of scale. The only good thing for us is that two things are not going away. The crisis of climate change is not going to go away, it's going to get worse. And the crisis of modern agriculture is not going away, it's going to get worse. So we have an opportunity there to use these two crises to become a new disruptive force to bring a difference. But that's really what the agenda for the future is. Thank you very much.